Welcome to our August Economic Vitality Committee meeting. I hope you enjoyed your uh, month off in July. Um, so and, and uh, doing the best you can to enjoy your summer with all the challenges that we're facing, but glad to see you all here today. We've got some great speakers. So I'd like to call to order and Pledge of Allegiance. Sharif, would you mind starting us off on that today? I got a feeling you're gonna ask me. Yes, I'm gonna, in fact, I'm gonna go like this. I'm standing up. I'm standing okay, up, good. I'm standing back. I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United, of the United, United States, States of America, America. And, to and to the, the Republic, Republic, which, for which it stands, one, one nation, nation under one God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all thank you sharif well done so we should uh do the roll call lisa is that correct next yes please say aye if you are here brian wilson aye ellen penske aye harsh goal aye jack council member belch <laughs> aye Kelly McClashy. So Kelly oh, McClashy is check. not here. Kelly McClashy is not here, but my name is Amos Nugent. I'm here. Oh, okay, so you're five. okay. She she won't be here today. Thank you, Amos. She she may be. I'm not sure, but I know I'm here. She she okay. reported this to me. Wonderful. Tiffany Cadret. Let's see here yet. Okay, Kaylin, if you could check the attendees just to make sure that we don't have any of our committee members in there. Rina Gupta? Aye. Sharif Madavi? Aye. Steve Baker? Aye. Steve Van Dorn? Aye. Sylvia Tien? Aye. Zach Grant? I didn't see Zach yet. Okay. Tracy Farhad? Aye. And Will Dorlet? Aye. We do have one, two, three, four EVC, five EVC members absent, but we do have a quorum. Thank you, Lisa, and uh, welcome, Kelly. Um, Sylvia, I know we've got some special guests of yours that are listening in. Uh, could you maybe give us a quick little uh, update on uh, who they are and where they're from? Okay, I'd, I'd be very happy to introduce them. Uh, actually, they are the youth division of Voice of Us, which is a uh, nonprofit organization which is uh, based in Pleasanton. Uh, we will be a media platform for communicating between all the groups, all the communi uh, communities, especially from Asian community to the mainstream and back, and back from mainstream to Asian community. So this uh, use uh, is our Amador High School schoolers so far right now, but we're looking to recruit more from Foothill so that we cover all the United States, uh, I mean, all the Pleasanton high school students. If they have passion, wanted to get involved, listen to what's going on in the city, be a great citizen, they are welcome to join our uh, youth group. So that's their mission to understand what we're doing, how everybody is using our daily life to help the city to moving forward. That's the major uh, mission. Wonderful. Well, uh, welcome um, to the, your guests, and uh, I'm glad they're able to join us this morning. Um, Steve, if I may, before we yeah, move forward, yeah, sure. um, Amos, can I have you introduce yourself to the EVC? Sure, I would love to. So, good morning, everyone. My name is Amos. Pardon me? Good morning. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Amos Nugent III, and I am the Director of Adult and Career Education with Pleasanton Unified School District. So, uh, Trustee Kelly Makashi, one of our uh, trustees uh, here, and I'm happy to be here today. Um, um, this is my second year with the district. Uh, formerly, Glenn Sparks uh, was in this role, and so you all may be familiar with him, and so we're just picking up uh, where he left off. So happy to be here today and joining the group. Welcome, Amos. Welcome, Thank Amos. Thank you. Glad you could be here. Um, any other things, Lisa? We'll move to the agenda amendments. Any amendments that we need to make to the agenda? No, okay, I see a shaking head. Okay, uh, let's move to the consent calendar, which I believe uh, includes the uh, approval of the minutes from June 17th. Um, everybody get a chance to read those. Uh, Mr. Baker, did you see anything that needs to be changed? Or are we good to go? Uh, we're good to go. 
All right, awesome. So could you make a motion for approval, please? I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes. I'll second it. I have a second. Thank you, Kelly. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any discussion? All right, we got the consent calendar completed. Do we have any folks from the public uh, listening in that would like to comment? Is there anyone from the public that's listening in? We do have three attendees, but we, I did not receive any notice that they'd like to speak at this time. Okay. Great, thank you, Lisa. So moving on to um, public hearings and other matters, uh, let's start with um, one of our favorite reports from council member Jack Balsh, uh, city council liaison report. It's all yours, Councilman. Uh, thank you. And still Jack, as I keep saying to you. Uh, so two meetings since the last time you met and, and uh, you guys know I missed uh, your June. So uh, we had uh, Vice Mayor Testa step in, but I'll just do them both like I normally do when, when a couple pass. So the July council meeting was our first meeting in the chambers. Uh, a little different, a little hybrid format, but um, frankly, very nice to get us, I think, back and trying to uh, have a step there. And, and we all know COVID is a bit, um, well, bobbing and weaving. So uh, things are fluid and should stay that way. A couple of big things on that agenda was we did approve via second reading 10X Genomics, which is outstanding. I'm, I'm happy to be the one that uh, was able to make the motion for that at the original meeting. Um, we also, just some things I picked out, we also at that time had ex, uh, granted the mayor authority to execute um, right, of way, right of way easements for 680 for southbound express lanes. Uh, and Pam, correct me if I'm wrong, it's been a while, but Acosta to 84. So, you know, that, that's the gap right now, as you probably know, north of us already has the express lanes, south of us already does as well. The couple of big events on the agenda then was 1383. Uh, this will affect Pleasanton. And, you know, I don't know if you've heard about it yet, but I'm going to mention it. It is basically a, a state uh, bill, Senate bill, to divert organics away from the landfills. And it, uh, it's a diversion program, plain and simple. The nuance is, is that the city must acquire uh, the diverted material. And that's the nuance because it's approximately 6,500, 6,500 tons of mulch. If we were to do it through 100% mulch, there's a lot of different uh, options available for diversion. We don't have to only buy mulch, but uh, mulch may be free in Pleasanton in a couple of years. So just, just keep that in mind. I, I hope they partner with Zone 7 to do uh, landscape conversions because you could sheet mulch, no problem. Um, Pop-ups was the other main event. Uh, so pop-ups, and I'm just going to be very clear, pop-ups are the uh, restaurant stalls that are in the parking spaces, okay? So when a restaurant sets up in the parking spot uh, and, and services uh, food and, and other amenities, that's a pop-up. So the city council uh, on a 4-1 vote uh, went ahead and extended those through December 31st with, I would say, and Pam can summarize, but with direction to staff to come up with guidelines and standards for a more permanent solution in the future. And I think we all realize that, uh, and Pam can probably talk to it, that, that those were put in quickly. And so sometimes we didn't fully uh, uh, be able to address accessibility and some other challenges there. Uh, I personally don't like the propane uh, right next to the rooftop. I'm just gonna go on record and say, that's probably not the safest uh, situation we could have. Um, the next item was Renewable 100 EBCE. You probably have seen that the city has moved towards that as a provider, and uh, the city chose to make the default option that uh, the Renewable 100. It's a little bit more expensive, approximately, and I, I don't have it in front of me, but I think it was $5 uh, uh, more for the Renewable but I wanna emphasize it's about choice and you do get to choose several different ways. You can opt down or opt out. And there's some restrictions accordingly, but, but that's at play. And then the other thing that the council did is consented to, uh, LAVMA is renewing their bonds. That's the pipeline that will pipe our waste over the hill into uh, the bay. 
uh, that the waste that we're not able to use and they are refinancing and it will save Pleasanton quite a, a lot of money through the bond finance. It's an interest rate refinance, if I was to summarize quickly. Uh, so that's July. August, uh, I'm going to start off to say we were in the chambers again, but everyone knows there's an indoor mask ordinance. Uh, I'm just going to clarify because this is my first meeting after that meeting uh, as a public official. I stated I had to take my mask off because I was dying or I needed to breathe. That was my personal problems and I'm not making a statement on masks and do not darken my doorstep looking for an advocate against masks because that's not me. Uh, between my wool suit and, and the air conditioning, I, I truly was about to pass out. So we resolved it at the break and uh, was back on track. But I just want to go on record that that was not what I intended. I just was having a problem personally. Uh, but we approved the Greek uh, Resurrection Greek Orthodox Church, uh, which is going to be a gorgeous campus, a gorgeous uh, building and church and grounds off of Dublin Canyon Road. Um, they did an outstanding amount of work with the Planning Commission. So I, I really uh, look forward to seeing that and hopefully attending some groundbreakings. Um, Another new thing that was on the consent calendar was an urgency ordinance to still cap uh, DoorDash or food delivery at 15%. Uh, there was some conversation about that and the extent of time, but uh, one year went forward uh, and it, it will sunset in a year or earlier if uh, deemed necessary. And, and so Pam and the staff will be uh, monitoring that. Um, we approved construction design for Nevada Street, and I picked that out because I, I'm watching what uh, people bring up in our public comments. So Nevada Street is approximately in front of Fire Station 1 on our east side of town. Uh, as you may recall, public storage was approved there and would be contributing some money to some improvements in that area. But at the same time, they're working on the design plans for upgrading their accessibility, sidewalks, trees, etc. So that contract for the design was approved. <clears throat> uh, management, uh, uh, confidential and management employees of Pleasanton were given a uh, budgetary 3% raise. Uh, it will be based upon what the city manager and HR review policies go through. Uh, people talk to me about, you know, is 3% appropriate or not? And I just wanna mention that um, the last time that management and confidential employees, I think, yeah, management and confidential employees received a raise was approximately 19 or 20 months ago before the pandemic, where all other uh, bargaining uh, groups had their scheduled. And, you know, we need our talent here. So, so we could debate that all day offline. But I'll just mention that that was approved. And then the main event, as people probably know, was Kaiser Air uh, at the Livermore Airport. Uh, just some facts from the staff report that I tried to lift for today was the airport was done in 1965. Uh, so that's when the airport was assembled. And we uh, quickly learned that the FAA, as you would probably maybe expect or assume, uh, controls all jurisdiction of the airspace. So the plane moving, the plane off the ground, the plane's flight path is all FAA purview. Uh, there was 14 uh, sites identified for noise studies and our initial data, uh, and there were seven in Pleasanton, I should clarify. Uh, and I had summarized the seven for Pleasanton. And so when I was looking at my sheet, I'm like, where's the Dublin and Livermore ones? But uh, it was right there behind, by the way. Uh, but the, the Pleasanton ones had a range from 49.1 decibels to 52.4 decibels. The staff report noted that there was um, city of Pleasanton has a 60 decibel uh, limit, but we also realized that, that that's your averages, right? That's your ranges. And so there's some conversation going. Lead fuel became a conversation topic as to what there. And so basically uh, the council basically uh, confirmed city staff recommendations to begin negotiations with our neighbors to the east and try to find some solutions and bring Dublin in. Uh, I specifically pushed or and the council agreed in, in whole, so I should not put me out there by myself, but uh, that we should try to uh, phase out the lead fuel, by the way. And, and there, we heard talk that there's an alternative unleaded out there. Uh, Weekend on Main was probably the next uh, big event people probably heard about. So Weekend on Main, and this is why I pulled it out from the pop-ups from the July conversation, right? Weekend on Main is the closure of Main Street. Uh, from approximately uh, city offices on the southern side to Del Val Parkway on the northern side. 
of Main Street. Obviously, people probably know it's a hard closure from uh, Friday afternoons or evenings around 3 p.m. till Sunday afternoons or you know early evenings. And so we heard a lot of comment between our retailers and our restaurateurs about uh, the challenges or opportunities we face. I will mention that um, it is unfortunate to me personally that the EBC didn't have a chance to weigh in based on when the agenda item came up. Uh, you know, because I think uh, this group could have could have obviously provided some clarity or information on that. In short, the council unanimously decided to go ahead and let it sunset after uh, eight, uh, September 6th, so it's after Labor Day, with direction to uh, talk to all the stakeholders, PDA, citizens, residents downtown and the city about what we can do for next year and how to bring it back in version 3.0. And I, I wanna just emphasize, because uh, I know I'm gonna take a lot of heat from a lot of people that love it, right? This is our, as I pointed out last night or Tuesday night, this is our beta version. This is version two, right? And so uh, I think uh, the council really understood that we wanna make it a long-term success. And maybe that means that we go ahead and sunset it now uh, for that to be achieved. So I'm hoping that we also provide our retailers an opportunity to uh, uh, have strong fourth quarter sales, which is the, heart, the strongest time of the year for them. Uh, and then there was an item for a police report update from city staff and the police department. And that got continued to the first item on our September 7th meeting. So I just wanna mention that. And Pam, I think I got everything, but any comments? Okay. She's very kind, by the way. But yeah, that's our nutshell. Thank you, Jack. Uh, great report. That was a lot to, to cover. Um, are there any just real quick questions for, for uh, Council Member Balch? Uh, Ellen has one, I think. Yeah. I do. I do. I had a question. I, I saw, I was been reading some articles, and I think it came up at the City Council meeting about Leadership Pleasanton. Yes. Yeah. And, I just wonder if there's, and I just wondered if there's a way that we as the EBC could support leadership Pleasanton and what's been going on. Cause I know I'm an alumna and I've seen some things. So I don't know if that's a topic that we can talk about. Yeah, even I would like to learn about it. I recently heard about that program. Uh, is that still happening? <laughs> So let, let, since since our chamber representatives on, I'll let him maybe speak so I don't walk into some something I shouldn't walk into. Well, I, I would recommend if we could take that on at the end of the agenda um, and discuss it then. Uh, but I appreciate you bringing it up, Ellen. Um, and uh, I would that's what I would recommend. And unless staff has other recommendations. I'm, the recommendation I'm that I would offer is happy to you know answer any initial questions, but that's not something that we're set to talk about today. It's not been agendized. So if there are a couple quick questions we want to answer just for clarity, happy to do that, but we're not going to engage in an extended conversation about leadership Pleasanton today, right? And as you all know, that's an item, the review of leadership Pleasanton and the city's participation is in the council's work plan. It is scheduled for the second year of the two-year work plan. And so our conversations, um, you know, at uh, at the council level um, and, and with staff working up to that will not be held anytime in the next couple months, um, as I understand. So just know that it's out there and there's a placeholder for it and we do intend to talk about it. But um, again, happy to answer basic questions, but no extended conversation today. Would we be able to put it on as an agenda at some point? Uh, it may be, Kelly. I don't, um, you know, again, I don't want to get out in front of the council and how the council chooses to have this discussion. And so I think that there's some um, thinking to do about when that may be appropriate. But, you know, should we decide that there's um, there's an appropriate time and place for the EBC to discuss it? We will. Um, but I just need to, to make sure that I'm, I'm um, coordinating with Nelson and how he's looking and talking to the council about bringing that forward. Yeah, just real quick, folks. I, I've actually I've done it. I've participated in it. So if anyone wants to talk offline, um, they can reach out to me and I can explain and, my experience. And I was going to say the same thing. And um, I appreciate your comments, Pam. I was just wondering if we at some point in the future can talk about EBC supporting it because I have participated as well and happy to share that information. And, thanks for your yeah. Thanks for the comments this morning. And I'll just mention, as Pam said, it it is a priority B which means second half, second year, right? And second year for the council, we're on, obviously that will be late summer next year. 
uh, based on the scheduling. I, I also will just say that we discovered that council member Arkin is the only one of the council members who has uh, participated in the program, but I would be interested in learning more. And so I'll be reaching out to people because I do not know the program. So for fodder just, in the future. Just real quick, just, I don't want to derail, but just real quick, just to confirm leadership pleasant and refers to support for entrepreneurship and small businesses. Um, Oh, thanks, Kelly. A uh, really important distinction. Um, again, I don't want to get too far afield, but when the city provides support to the chamber, we do it in two different pieces um, under the same agreement. And one of those pieces is for leadership Pleasanton specifically. And the other piece of that is for leadership, uh, excuse me, for um, innovation and entrepreneurship events and activities. And so while there's one agreement, the discussion that the council is poised to have is only focused on leadership Pleasanton. I have not heard any discussion that the council is interested in talking about our support um, with the chamber for innovation and entrepreneurship events. So that okay. stays. Yeah. I was just asking for the benefit for those who might not yeah. be familiar with what even leadership Pleasanton is. So, all right. Perfect. Go ahead Thank with you. the agenda. Thank you. Good distinction. Thank you for bringing it up, Ellen. And of course, if anyone would like to talk to me offline about it, um, I'd be happy to do so. So um, let's move along then. And we've got some great uh, speakers with us today that we're so happy they can join us. Um, the first speaker for today is going to talk about, well, both are going to talk about the tri valley market, industry trends, um, and what we're doing to set up ourselves to continue to be strong in the future. So our first speaker today is Lauren Moon uh, with Mirador Capital Partner. She's going to talk about their newest report that just came out, the Mirador View. So Lauren, welcome. Thank you for getting up early with us this morning. We appreciate you being here. Thanks, Steve. And thanks, everyone, for having me. It's nice getting to see you all, hopefully, um, in person one of these days. But we're so used to Zoom, it's almost as good now. <laughs> um, so, uh, I think, I hope many of you have seen this report, whether this not this year or prior years, if you haven't, um, I'm happy to send an electronic copy over um, to Lisa and she can forward it to the committee. Um, I'm just gonna touch on kind of our high level takeaways and um, kind of our gr continuing growth thesis on the region. So, um, I think for the sake of just something to look at other than my face, I might share my screen. Is that all right? Is that something I can do? And then I can um, kind of highlight these portions of the report that speak to what I'm talking about. Um, let's see, it looks like, oh, there we go. Okay. So, um, to kind of take a step back, so Mirador Capital Partners is, uh, we're a, a comprehensive wealth management company headquartered in Pleasanton. Um, our founder, Don Garman, started Mirador about seven years ago, uh, essentially based on the thesis that he wanted to be able to invest independently, largely in the Tri-Valley, um, as he wasn't able to do so at his prior firms. He was seeing activity like Workday and Viva and these exciting companies um, grow. And uh, we had kind of this in not inside perspective, but we're here, they're in our region. So we're interested in them learning about them and wanted to be able to take part in that growth. Um, so Mirador was formed. Um, I came on in 2015. And one of the first things I did was um, launch this effort to write this report. So we had the thesis that companies in the Tri-Valley do extremely well. We wanted to test that from a qualitative and quantitative standpoint. Um, we started with interviewing many of the regional leaders, many um, who are on this call right now. I remember meeting with Pam back in 2015 and saying, why is Pleasanton great? Why do companies come here? So um, digging into that early research, we you know, started to hear the same story over and over again, which is that there's attractive real estate, a highly educated population, um, a lot of entrepreneurial activity, great access to the Bay Area. So we formed this index, the Mirador Tri-Valley Index, um, to compare its performance sort of, okay, from our, we're investment managers, so it's great. The Tri-Valley is 
qualitatively a wonderful place to be, but can we translate that into actually investment returns and have our clients participate in that growth? So we formed the Mirador Tri-Valley Index. This was back in 2015, tested it back over 10 years. And sorry, the Tri-Valley Index is, an, is, a, is a combination of public companies headquartered in the Tri-Valley. So um, that includes companies like Chevron and Workday and 10X Genomics and Viva um, and, and several others. But in 2015, we'd looked back over the prior 10 years and said, wow, the Tri-Valley companies have more than doubled the performance of the S&P 500. So we formed an investable index and started writing this report every year to follow the economic um, activity of our region. And we also highlight some stories of companies along the way, but it's it's been, it's going into 2020, this was an exciting year for us because we see the COVID drop off, this is the chart here, obviously, and then rapid acceleration of growth from public companies. And this really tells the story of everything we saw in the region. Of course, this, you know, I don't want to be insensitive here. This doesn't apply to everyone and every company, but from a kind of more macro tri valley standpoint, 2020 was overall an acceleration of our tri valley thesis from an economic standpoint. Um, so with that, I'll get into some highlight points. 45% um, growth, that was the increase in overall price of Tri-Valley companies. We had three companies in the region go public, and we also had record venture capital valuations of 600, or sorry, not valuations of capital raises of 642 million. So um, as part of our research on this, uh, we were surprised initially to see how much venture activity there was in the Tri-Valley. We know there's a lot of entrepreneurial talent, a lot of innovation, um, but we were surprised just how much. And I've spoken to this before, and it's really uh, focused in two key areas, which is uh, cloud SaaS computing and um, life sciences, with particularly a component in any life science company that requires a manufacturing component. If there's an actual tool or um, a warehouse uh, needed next to office space, um, companies here have this advantage. Um, we talk about this as kind of this unique geographic advantage stemming from, you know, I, I'm sorry to repeat myself for many of you who've heard me say this a few times, but one of the exciting things about the Tri-Valley is how close we are to Silicon Valley. So these other regions like Austin and Portland and Denver that are kind of the next Silicon Valley, they can be great for a lot of things, but we have this benefit of actually being geographically adjacent to Silicon Valley, which means we have access to investment capital based here. We have access to the top tech workers in the country and the world that move here. We have access to this very skilled labor force in the Central Valley that would, of course, prefer to commute into Pleasanton or Livermore than go all the way to the Inner Bay Area. Um, so it's this regional hub that we've been talking about for the last six years saying this is really spurring all this growth. And so what happened in 2020 is that all of these kind of factors that we've been talking about um, accelerated, right? People are more focused on working from home where you know they care more about where they live. They're able to work more remotely. So where do they go? We're seeing now, obviously there was a large exodus out of the state, but there was also within the Bay Area, a major move to Tri-Valley cities. So we have a chart down here that, that we show where people move the most popular destinations among those from San Francisco who filed a change of address in a new county. So the only two counties that had net positive migration were Alameda and Contra Costa County, our Tri-Valley regions. Um, so uh, that's part one of you know, attracting people to our region, high quality of life, um, relatively more affordable real estate, although that is rapidly changing as everyone has seen. Um, so then uh, component number two was education. So education, 
we've seen over the last several years that the percent of an adult population with at least a master's degree has been higher in the Tri-Valley than in Silicon Valley or the Greater Bay Area. And in 2020, we actually saw this number increase. Last year, it was at, I think, 27 or 28%, and it bumped up to 30%, actually widening the margin. So what that tells us in part is that the, the uh, folks who are moving here are highly educated, right? Or that's, that's the way the region is shifting. It's becoming more educated and not less educated. The other interesting factor um, was these education statistics we follow for high schoolers. Um, while you would have expected these to kind of fall significantly based on remote schooling and all the other challenges the year posed, they actually increased. Graduation rates were extremely high, um, more kids were meeting UC requirements, and we stayed at a 1% dropout rate. So, I mean, I won't, it was a strange year from an education standpoint, but it is encouraging to see that those numbers stayed strong, which I think reflects um, the kind of unique ability our region has to support education, kind of despite everything that's going on. So real estate, um, here's some charts on real estate, Bay Area median rental costs, change in rental rates. So Tri-Valley in rental real estate was one of the only regions that actually saw an increase in rental, property rentals over 2020. We know San Francisco dropped, San Mateo, Santa Clara County, Silicon Valley dropped as people exited the region. This is just another validation point of that increase. Um, and we still see that even with this fluctuation, we're, we're relatively cheaper than Palo Alto from residential rents. But for one of the first time since I've been looking at this, rents are now more expensive on average than Santa Clara. San Francisco, is, this is the county level, so it's a little bit, um, you know, we're not saying we're more expensive than San Francisco downtown right now, but it, this has been a significant shift in trends in 2020. Uh, medium home sales prices. Uh, again, um, Tri-Valley increased, but you can see that it's still significantly lower than the rest of the Bay Area. And I know we talk a lot about housing affordability here and all of the problems that causes, which I, you know, we are all feeling firsthand. But I think it's also important to keep in mind that relative to the rest of the Bay Area, the Tri-Valley is still more affordable. So it's, it's hard to imagine, but that does continue to be a draw from places like Mountain View and Palo Alto and even Fremont. Um, on the commercial real estate part, I won't, I don't, Brian, are you going to talk about this? I don't need to dig in a whole lot if you are. No. Uh, no, it's not, it's not my understanding that I am. Okay. Um, so most of this information came from Brian, so I will give him credit for that. Um, my takeaway from commercial real estate, and Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, is that at least at the time we were writing this report, um, there wasn't a ton of commercial real estate turnover yet. Leases weren't coming due. People weren't um, actively exiting their leases. People are just kind of waiting to see how this work from home shakes out, if people are going to come back, so on and so forth. But um, what I thought was interesting is that the industrial workspace component, industrial rents actually rose and then vacancy rates decreased. So industrial office space um, is where people are doing manufacturing or operations or I, I feel very silly talking about this in front of Brian, who's the actual <laughs> expert on this. But, but the, the point is that many Tri-Valley businesses did not shut down during COVID. They were essential businesses or they were in life science spaces. They had to do work in labs. And so they still needed a place to show up every day. And that really stabilized a significant, it, it just increased demand for our industrial real estate and flex R&D spaces. Um, so, you know, tying that back to what I said at the beginning with 2020 accelerating our, our growth thesis, um, the strengths that our companies have here in SaaS, so people were able to work remotely, um, efficiently, and then with hard tech and manufacturing, we have a space for that that attracted people there. So both kind of both of those sectors did very well over the year. Um, 
the other things I'll talk about, I think is the venture, venture capital raise. We talked about the Meritor Tri-Valley Index. Um, I'll just point out some high, high bullet points. So Tri-Valley companies have gross sales in 2020 of 133 billion and a total market cap of 379 billion. I just thought that those were pretty um, remarkable numbers to be aware of. And you can see here the kind of side-by-side Tri-Valley companies versus the S&P by year. Um, 2019 was the closest tie and all the others have been pretty, had a pretty remarkable gap. Um, and some people will say, oh, that's because we are in cloud or we're in life sciences, but it's actually a fairly diversified index. We, there's a number of um, you know, we have Chevron as an energy company, we have some industrial companies, we have other business service and finance companies. So it is a fairly diverse um, composition of industries that we do have here that helps as well when we have uh, downturns in certain sectors. Um, finally, I'll just wrap up with a snapshot of venture activity. Um, here, so our venture capital raised by sector. I'm gonna blow this up here if I can. Um, so 2017, 18, 19, 2020, 642 had record levels of venture capital raised in the Tri-Valley region. And this is, it continues this trend, the orange is software companies. Um, that's obviously always a large component. The red is life science companies, a larger component. And then, uh, this teal, whatever we want to call that, is other science and dark blue high tech engineering. Green is non science. So you see, we're basically life sciences and software. And the ownership proportion of that changes over time. 2020 was very significant for software, less so for life sciences, but I don't, that's not so much in terms of an indicator of life sciences here. It's more of an indicator of the venture market and the types of companies that were raising venture funding in 2020. Um, and then 2021, this was just through the beginning of June and you can see we were at 455 million, less than halfway through the year. So if we continue on pace, um, 2021 should be pretty remarkable. So um, overall, sorry if I got too kind of far into the weeds for everybody, but, um, this was a very, 2020 was a really exciting year and 2021 has been also for us to watch. Um, we have been, you know, Tri-Valley and Pleasanton cheerleaders of the space and hoping um, that this thesis would um, prove true even when it was tested as, um, you know, as strongly as it was in 2020 and it did. Um, so we are uh, finding that all of these items, life sciences particularly are accelerating and um, we're, we're here to follow it. So I'm happy to take any questions or dig into anything more specifically if, um, if there are questions. Thank you, Lauren. That was uh, awesome, wonderful, exciting news, um, especially during COVID to see those numbers. We have a few questions that we can take uh, right now. I, Will's got his hand up. Will, uh, go for it. Excellent, Lauren, thanks very much. Um, with the, um, uh, the uh, VC investment, um, I saw some breakdown as far as what round the companies were in. Do you, do you have anything more granular? I mean, versus I startup. And, versus um, I have more granular data to, as a backup. Let's see. You know, we have, we have charts sometime. There's a there will be a, there's a chart in a prior year that speaks to that in more detail. But what we have found is that the Tri Valley has a larger concentration than Silicon Valley than the rest of the Bay Area in early seed and A startups. But we do still have okay. those growth companies in larger growth rounds. So what that has indicated to us is that companies are able to start here, which is important, but they're also able to grow and continue to receive funding. And we've heard stories time and time again of, you know, they get an office space in one location, they expand to the next location, you know, then they get a larger building AI that just officially launched their ticker on NASDAQ yesterday, 
is a great example of that. They were in Innovate Pleasanton with Gray Kitchen, and then they expanded into another office space in Pleasanton, and then they moved to Dublin, which, you know, for our purposes is still good. <laughs> Sorry, Pam. <laughs> but. Um, well, that, that's an important distinction because yes. it, it means that, that they start here, but they also stay here. Exactly. And, yeah. If so, if you're seeing more mezzanine round financing, then yes, you know, there's an indication that there's you know uh, you know growth in the area, and you know you don't get your start up here and then move someplace else. Exactly. Excellent. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Will. Uh, Sharif, uh, you're next. Lauren, uh, excellent. And you know, I read this last night, but now that I heard it, it just makes a lot more sense. So. You know, it seems like we're just the, on the beneficiary end of an incredible, I don't know if I call it momentum or, you know, a 30 or 40 year trend. This didn't obviously happen overnight. My, and it looks just like, this is like almost too good to be true. This is so good what's happening. It supports the, you know, the uh, city's objective of making us a life science hub. This is like the result, but you are in the investment community and you understand risk just in the same way you understand reward. So Let's talk about what are the risk factors to this kind of really golden era that we're in. What do you see? Sure. So, um, sorry, I'll stop this so I can see you guys better. Uh, I've been thinking about this and I come back to what is our growth thesis? Like, what are the drivers of this growth? And if this growth were to stop, from my perspective, it comes back to something disrupting those drivers of growth, right? So first and foremost, from my perspective, if we lose our quality of life, right? Like people come here because it's a nice place to live. It's a nice place to raise a family for great schools and great education. So I think maintaining the quality of our schools is incredibly important. Um, I think uh, maintaining kind of this culture of inclusivity and um, family. I mean, so I personally, we moved here from Redwood City almost seven years ago now to Pleasanton and we're blown away by the parks and the rec programs and the parades down Main Street and just the quality of the community here. And so mm -hmm. I think, um, from my perspective, if that changes, people will be less inclined to come here. I know that that's very kind of theoretical and qualitative, but that's really what stood out first of mine. Second of all, you know, the ability to keep highly educated talent here. And that will kind of be uh, affected by what happens in the greater Bay Area. Right? If companies are leaving the state and changing headquarters to other places, that will pull pools of talent there. Um, I'm a little bit more skeptical than some that that is going to happen to a great extent, but you know, I, I could be wrong. So I think the ability to attract companies here, the ability to support them, the ability to support um, companies specifically with this uh, advanced manufacturing component, um, and then general quality of life for residents here. You heard it from the experts. <laughs> That's great, Lauren. Uh, we all talk about that, uh, but it really comes to fruition when you look at these reports. Mm -hmm. So thank you for just clarifying how important it is to keep schools and all those other areas uh, moving forward. And uh, then that uh, is a good segue into Kelly's question. So Kelly. Yeah, great. Um, thank you, Lauren and Brian, for a great compilation of data. Very, very informative. Uh, my question is really overarching to some conversations we've had previously and in terms of is there any data to show on um, hires from the community, um, postgraduates from either high school, those types of positions, or postgraduate, really about, uh, you know, how are we supporting uh, opportunities for jobs for people who live in our area um, and really supporting our youth who have either recently graduated from high school
school or postgraduate from college. So that's, um, and I don't know if you have the data, but would love to hear, because you mentioned in the report, you know, um, a lot of entrepreneurship startups. And um, so I didn't know if you were able to have any data that digs into, you know, hires into some of the positions and jobs that you've highlighted in this report. You know, our data does not go to that level. And that's something we've not been able to track down. But Lynn, Lynn, I feel like you guys have some insight into that. Yeah, a, a little bit, but there are a lot of people working on it. There's clearly yeah. a need in this area at Kelly yeah. for sure. And it is part of the 2040 vision plan. So I will look forward to talking about that with you next. Yeah, I think that'd be great just because, you know, it's such a great area and opportunity for, um, for positions and work um, and, and really supporting, you know, our graduates who are actually graduating in the area to come back and find positions here. And I, I know there's been some conversations of, you know, um, you know, whether it be their credentials um, in the biotech field or for other fields and, you know, supporting um, those types of job positions. So we'd love to hear any updated reports on that. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, any other questions from anybody? Just, you know, unmute yourself. We, uh, okay, no? Hey, it's, not, it's not a question though, but real quick, uh, folks, I just wanted to add. So if you recall last time, I know it's been a, a couple months now, but uh, what we presented on the life science ecosystem, um, one being Brandon Carville with Daybreak Labs, but so he actually, he was formerly called the switch and AI actually was incubated there before, um, you know, Innovate Pleasanton or whatever with Greg Hitchin, but he was with um, the switch and he actually incubated there first coming out of um, Lawrence Livermore. So it's just kind of, kind of unique or kind of cool how it all kind of comes full circle. So. Yeah, very, very exciting. Cool. So um, good morning. I would like to ask a question if it's okay. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Yeah. Um, again, being a novice of the group, forgive me if this is already known or in practice, but based off the report, I think it was excellent. And coming in, this is the exact type of labor market information that I'm just excited about. And, you know, overseeing the career technical education pathways here in the district, really want to make sure we're being responsive to, uh, to ensure that we can start uh, helping to maintain the, the quality of schooling that you suggested to hedge against risk and ensure our students can fill those needs. So my question is, um, with the either the, the members, particularly of the of the of the index that you created, like those companies, like is there a way that we can bring some of those representatives together to partner with our our schools and our CT pathways so that we can have relationships um, to help form um, advisory committees so that we can ensure the instruction that's happening in the classrooms is most current with industry practice, potentially set up uh, internships and opportunities, even externships for teachers to remain current in that field because most of them have been teaching for so long. So just, is there a way where we can partner together more to expand the relationship? Hey, Amos, it's Pam. That's probably less a Lauren question. Lauren, okay. unless you wanted to, to jump. No, I was gonna say, I think Lynn's all over that one. <laughs> and, and Lynn will have some information to share with us, certainly in the work that she, she does. But I wanted to offer, too, that there's a model that's been out there that I, if I understand correctly, was intended to do this. And I don't know that it's been um, as efficacious as we want it to be, but maybe tweaking it or rethinking about it. So it's tech, you know, the Tri-Valley Educational Collaborative. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, that's really the intent was to bring uh education and business, right, together with other partners to try and create those opportunities to get business really much more aligned with what's happening in the schools and vice versa. And so maybe that's a conversation we can have at a future EVC meeting about okay. what, what that program looks like and if it's the right program or if there are other opportunities and, you know, getting informed from what Lynn's going to share with us and, and her work on the 2040 vision. I think we'll all bring that together. Thank you. Great. Um, I think it's time to move on unless there's any other comments. Uh, thank you again, Lauren. That was, uh, Thanks, Lauren. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, Appreciate it. having me. We always yeah. love positive news, especially today. So that was awesome. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Lynn Naylor, who's uh, the uh, president and CEO of Innovation Tri-Valley. Uh, Lynn uh, has a lot of great things that her group is working on with, with uh, furthering uh, the Tri-Valley. So 
Lynn, I would look forward to hearing from you. And again, welcome. Thank you, Steve and Sharif. Thank you so much. I'm I'm absolutely thrilled to be here this morning. And Lauren, wow, round of applause. That there's just so much I don't need to say now because you've covered it so beautifully. And uh, we really appreciate the partnerships with all of you. And Lisa's going to help me with some slides this morning. I have an internet. Uh, situation in Danville today. So one of the things we're going to fix by 2040 is fantastic broadband for all of us, right? But I, I just want to say good morning, so many great faces, um, and do a shout out to Jack Balsh. He is the uh, city council representative liaison to ITV, and it's been so fun to get him involved in 2040 work. He's been very active, and uh, we have a board member on this morning, Tracy Farhad. And uh, thanks to all of our friends, Pamela and Lisa at the city. This collaboration is a key element of why this innovation hub is succeeding. Um, and I'm so glad that Lauren's been here and Brandon's been here and Brian Wilson has been here talking about life sciences specifically and um, what's happening in that sector. But the innovation hub is big. So Lisa, if you'll give me that next next couple of slides, I'm just going to tell you a couple of things quickly about who we are. ITV is a collective of leaders that's committed to making all of this data that you have just heard from Lauren go to work for the region. We are about collaboration and working together and we are advocates for the region as a technology and innovation powerhouse with that terrific quality of life. Lisa, that next slide. So you'll see for us, the innovation ecosystem is enormous. It's big and rich. So you see it's the startup community, it's our accelerators and our incubators, the education community that is fueling that pipeline that Kelly was just talking about, it's the 450 tech companies, both large and small, global innovators from the national labs that we're so lucky to have, the VC investors. Our nonprofit leaders are enormous innovators. You see what Steve's doing at the Pleasanton Chamber. They've been really involved in, um, in ITV from the start. And of course, the collaborative approach of our elected officials, Pam and city government, city of Pleasanton and Pleasanton Chamber of Commerce are enormously important to the ecosystem. It's got to take all of this data and move it forward quickly. So um, next slide, I just want to show you this to you really quickly. We've talked about all the data, so you have a quick refresher course, but I love this slide because it shows you that purple heart right in the center. This is a reminder the Tri-Valley sits at the center of the Northern California mega region. We are at the heart of the California mega region. And the brand identity about the region is the next slide here, Lisa. Our, our branding and logo for the region is Tri-Valley, the heart of California innovation. So it's not only all the success that you talk about um, from Lauren's numbers and the Mirador report, but it's one, the geographic heart of the region. And the next slide, Lisa, will show you that it is about the heart of the leadership in this region. We work together collaboratively, focused on growth and protecting that lifestyle. So heart of California innovation because we are at the heart of the region and because we lead with heart. And this is really important as you look to uh, some of the data and what we do with it next. This is a region that really cares about how long people are in their cars commuting, that really cares about what the impact of the growth will be and what the balance will be in our community. So I just want to follow up quickly this next slide. We agree with Lauren that the three sectors that are thriving in the region, life sciences, advanced manufacturing, and SaaS, cloud, and if you'll go to this next slide really quickly, Lisa, for me. I just want to mention that 
Innovation Tri-Valley's role in the life science conversation is that we are working to attract businesses to the region using some of the data that Lauren's been able to unearth. And this is a project I just wanna to mention to this group because this is a way we can work together. This is a project that will be going out in Q4, talking about the incredible success in the, in the sector. And there's some, probably some things you can do as a group to help us get this information out. I don't wanna spend a lot of time on it because you have um, had some great conversations about it, but there is a great work, we, a great deal we can do together, especially with the commercial real estate community to help people know what's happening in the region and what's available here. So that's just a, an intro. What I really wanna talk about on the next slide is the real magic and the energy that comes out of the data and now has been propelled into a 2040 vision plan. Uh, we are the fastest growing region in the Bay Area, both in population and jobs. So this project came together out of uh, research that we'd done in 2018 and 2019 together with the cities and it continues to advance with uh, all the work that we just heard about. But the idea was if coming out of all of this data, we see how quickly we're growing, what kind of region do we wanna be in the year 2040? What do we wanna be? And the observation with, by our partner, the Bay Area Council Economic Institute, is that we have never been a region that waited for other people to tell us what we should be or what the confines were be. What, what is it that we wanna be? And so Innovation Tri-Valley Leadership Group set out in 2019 to create a vision for the region in 2040. And you'll see some of the collaboration that's taken place over the last year. The pandemic has allowed us to a little more time to work together, but it's been an exciting project. It's important to know, this is not ITV's plan, a thousand stakeholder inputs, a thousand people looked at some of this data and talked about what do we want to be in the year 2040. All of our regional partners were involved, the cities, the counties, the chambers, and um, we're really grateful to all of you for taking the time and energy. What do we want to be in the year 2040? The next slide tells you just a little bit, it's been fun to do the great work and the rollout. And I just wanted to do a quick nod to Tracy Farhad because she's on the call today. She helped us do the rollout event. Um, it's live on our YouTube channel. Really encourage you to take a look and see the rollout of the plan. What's important about it is that the plan was rolled out through the eyes of our young people. If you think about who will be running the region in the year 2040, it's not us. And the young people spoke to some of the ideas in the plan in such a beautiful way. We wanted everyone to hear it from them. So I'll put it in the in the chat box, but it's um, a really wonderful video. It's only half an hour, but it really is inspirational. This was a groundbreaking, sweeping blueprint for the region. And as far as we know, nobody has ever done a plan like this. So Lisa, the uh, next slide will show some of the major themes that emerged in the plan. Oops. Yeah, a little slow this morning. All right, we'll, we'll this is where we are in the timeline. In 2019, we launched the plan. Right now, it's really important to know we are just in the exploration and the implementation, doing the due diligence about how some of these things could come to life. So I want you to be fully informed about all the ideas in the plan and know we'll begin implementing Q1, Q2 next year. There will be lots of opportunities to uh, be involved, share thoughts about it. But right now we're just looking at uh, what, how really we could bring some of these ideas to life. So um, the next slide, please, Lisa. Here are the major themes. As you would imagine, this region wants to talk about the world-class talent that we have, the critical connections that we have in a very sophisticated ecosystem that already exists in the region vibrant placemaking. A lot of people are working on telling the narrative and the story 
And a new theme that has, is embedded in everything in the plan is diversity, equity, and inclusion. What do we wanna look like in 2040? How can we do some of what we're doing even better and make opportunities available to more people in our region? Our young people expect that of us. They're looking for leadership in this way. And of course, green economy came out is a really strong leader, um, leading conversations, uh, especially with the labs and some of our green energy companies. What can we do? And what is the expectation? What do we want to do in terms of leading? The next quote is one you'll hear a lot about. Jeff Belisario led this project for the Bay Area Council Economic Institute. You'll hear us talk about it a lot. The 2040 vision plan proves that the Tri-Valley can be the place that rewrites the economic development playbook for California. We have the narrative, we have the story, and now we have a lot of ideas about how we can attract new companies, generate new investments, look at new housing types. We're really excited about walkable communities, some, some green options, but I think it's very important to note that the Tri-Valley does things differently than other regions. That's part of the reason we're so successful. That's part of the reason CEOs want to grow their companies. They are moving here. I'm so glad Lauren shared the data about really where companies are moving and where they're not coming, where they're not moving. Uh, there is uh, really no way to do justice to all of the ideas, but Lisa, I'll show you, the next slide will show you, there are 24 major recommendations in the plan. Um, they're, they're a little tough to see here, but partly because I want you to read them. I want you to go to the website, download the plan, and really spend some time thinking about uh, what we could be. It's important to us that you think about these not as solutions, problems we're trying to solve, but rather it's really an opportunity to take all of this good news you've just heard and think about how good we could be as a region. How could this innovation hub be unique and distinctive? And there are 24 ideas here that set us apart in really, really bold ways. So I, you, I will call out here, there, I can't tell you what my favorites are. And honestly, um, I want this committee to know we're not out talking about this plan yet. This is the first time we've talked about the 2040 plan. And I, was, I think it's super cool that Pleasanton's on the cutting edge. You wanna know first what's happening and we're really glad to share this data with you. But this, you'll see a lot of this out in the community in the next, um, in the next, few months. Certainly, there's going to be great conversation about housing, about solving the digital divide, about leveraging the incredible success we've seen in our healthcare community, collaborating in marketing efforts. Um, there's a call for a new philanthropic, philanthropic fund in the region. There's going to be a lot of great dynamic conversation about that especially on the learning side. I'm really excited that Kelly and some of the others have picked up on that. This region has uh, incredible data that supports how good we are at educating and valuing creativity and innovation, but there's so much more we could be doing and so much more we can do better if we focus on lifelong learning and creating uh, that community college pipeline that uh, builds a private sector pipeline for the talent that we need in the future. There's so much here we can do. So next slide, please. I just wanted to kind of introduce the um, projects. Lisa, can you give me that next slide, please? So this is where we are now. I wanna share with you the ideas. I hope you'll read the plan. Um, we are, whoops. That it, it doesn't matter. This is a, uh, we are exploring implementation, doing our due diligence about how the five communities can best work together to do some of this planning over the next year or so. And we're um, evaluating project attractiveness. 
there's some very important uh, ways to measure value creation, what could the impact be for the region, and then what are the obstacles, and how do you weigh which projects you move forward. So you have some moonshots, so you have some gold mines, so you have uh, quick, quick hits that move the region forward. You have pieces of the puzzle that make the region even more distinctive and successful. So we are in this exploration and implementation process right now. And I'm very excited. We will be coming to spend some time with the city of Pleasanton and Jack and Lisa and Pamela and back to this committee about some of those conversations. But this is where we are. We're just in um, the evaluation process. And we're taking the ideas out to the public. That next slide will show you that um, we work on a, an insert with the San Francisco Business Times every year. This insert features the plan and the 24 ideas in the plan and talks about rewriting the economic playbook for California because it's such a unique vision. And we will take this out. This insert will go uh, out in San Francisco Business Times, the full run in San Francisco, the full run in Silicon Valley. So part of our role at ITV is not only to advocate for the programs, to drive the programs, to welcome, welcome the community in, but also to tell the world what we're doing and what's happening. So a lot of uh, visibility for the plan right now and in the future weeks. And so the next piece is the annual State of the Tri-Valley um, annual event, which we hold in partnership with the San Francisco Business Times. I know um, the Pleasanton Chamber is also helping to promote this event. We welcome you to come join this conversation. This is the next piece of this rollout happens next Thursday in the afternoon from three to four. We'd love to have you. And I, one of the most exciting pieces is that we've been able to engage the new first woman director of Lawrence Livermore National Labs, Dr. Kim Budell. And she's going to really be introduced to the community at this event. So a lot of great leaders from some of the companies that we've just talked about will be at this event and talking about where we go together in the future. So you're the first to hear some of it. I hope you'll keep looking at it. And we welcome you to join some of these conversations as part of our innovation community. And down the line, when we figure out how we're gonna organize some of the conversations a little more deeply. So welcome questions and conversations. And so grateful to all of you for thinking about how great the region can be with Pleasanton as one of the shining stars in the Tri-Valley. Any questions? I think I saw one from Rena there popped up. Yeah, I, I didn't understand the term vibrant placemaking. I somehow I didn't understand what uh, that means. Yeah, placemaking is really, uh, actually several people on this call can talk about it, but being sure people know Pamela, certainly the city is involved in placemaking and so is Tracy Farhad, but the uh, making sure that the narrative, the story of the community is told in a dynamic way so that place, so people have a sense of place. What is it? Okay, it's really so, it's, so special. it's, okay. I just wanted yeah, to. It's that message. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they feel good about living here. Yeah, and we attract people. I know Tracy mm -hmm. Farhad's got some recent data that people come and look at the region several times before they move here. And what are those first impressions? And what are the stories that they hear about the region? And what is that constant flow of exciting news out of the region? So that's all yeah. placemaking. Okay, got it. Cool. Thanks. Uh, Rena also, I think, asked if she could get a copy, we could get a copy of your presentation, but wouldn't most of this be on your website, Lynn? Uh, and your actual is. report. So, and, and your website again yeah. is. I think Lisa was an angel and just put it in the chat. You just, so oh, there, there it is. Okay. There. Beautiful. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. She's reading my mind. Okay. Great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Ke Kelly, uh, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, it's just there was one slide deck about um, interviews or fairs, and I just wondered if there is. It had said 25 uh, interviews conducted so far. And um, did that include perhaps um, audience for um, 
at the college yeah. level or high school level? I was just curious. And if not, if that would be an opportunity down the road. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. Actually, the education community here as part of the Innovation Hub is phenomenal. And when new leaders like uh, the new president, Las Positas College, came to this region, couldn't believe how well the infrastructure was already developed. So yes, high school, oh, the education workshops were the largest workshops we held. So Las Positas College, UC Merced, um, uh, uh, East Bay, Cal State East Bay, all of the colleges were involved as well as all of the um, school districts, all five school districts. And there was a huge contingent of students that talked to us about, they want to be able to learn any skill, every skill. They want to have jobs available to them. And so there is one of the major recommendations is to strengthen that pipeline using private sector to be sure that no student is left behind, no worker is left behind, that there are new programs that help people learn the skills that are needed right now. And uh, so really push that process along a little bit faster. It would definitely be a top recommendation about that. Okay, great. So do you have more information about summaries of those successes on your website to point to our directions, just in case I have an opportunity to share out at upcoming board meetings or, you know, help promote um, what you're doing? <clears throat> Absolutely. And if you, in the report, there are several specific recommendations. As Lauren said, people move here expecting to have a fantastic educational system. We're one of the best in the state. How can, we, how can we be one of the best in the nation and the world? Those are the conversations that these groups are having. And so there are specific recommendations in the plan. I hope you'll read them and, and take them to your community. And I'd be happy to talk more about the education sure. initiative specifically. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Lynn. Uh, Sharif, you had your hand up for a second. Did you, uh, it got answered or? Okay, pulled, pulled back on me. All right, that's cool. <laughs> Uh, anybody else have any comments about uh, the wonderful things that ITV is working on to further uh, our area? Dave, no? I just want to mention no, in the chat, no. I included a link to the 2040 vision plan. And then I also included a link to the State of the Tri-Valley event that Lynn mentioned. Um, and then at, uh, after the meeting, I can share a link to Lynn's presentation, um, as I know Rena had asked for that. So Great. Hey, and Lynn, I'm sorry, Steve, Lynn, the, the rollout event, do you have, you know, that you did a month or so ago, do you still have the video link to that? Is that available to folks or? Yes. And it's on our YouTube channel. It is. I, okay. I'll, yeah. Great. But we'll I grab that. It's good. It's so important to hear from the next generation. Yep. This is not our plan. This is not our future. And they have. They're incredible and brilliant and have high expectations from the region. And it's really exciting to hear directly from them. Yeah, thanks. It was really powerful. And I think Kelly, of you know, as much as anybody else would really enjoy seeing that. So yeah, absolutely. Just what I was gonna say, Kelly, you're gonna wanna see that firsthand from the students on that video. Well done, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, and I get the other ask I have is, well, how can we help you as a committee to further your um, uh, project and getting uh, getting things moving, keeping them moving forward? So I just I throw that out to you and to Pamela and Lisa to see if we can how we can stay engaged to assist. Yeah, absolutely. We need you and want you to be involved. I think in the short term, there's a lot of work we can do together in the life sciences area to be sure these companies are happy here and attracting new companies. That's a short term piece we're really focused on in Q4 this year. And so we'd love to continue to talk about that. And I will stay in close touch. And you've got a great representative in Jack Balsh on our, on our board. So he'll be a direct line of communication all the way along too. So thank you. Thank you again, Lynn. Really appreciate you being here. Exciting stuff. Very positive. Love, love to hear that. So um, having, uh, oh, Pamela, do you have anything? Oh, oh okay. Okay. <laughs> so you raise your hand there. Uh, let's move along to the next item. Uh, we're to receive economic development information updates. I'm assuming Lisa or Pamela are going to be 
giving those. So thank you. So nothing else to add, um, but just wanted to highlight the um, collaboration with the Pleasanton Chamber on the 2021 Pleasanton Economic Drivers. And so we, I know Steve, you might wanna touch on the videos that we have that will be coming out um, for that, but just wanted to, to pull that out. Great, yes, uh, the, the last piece of that is we're putting together some videos that we're waiting for still from one company. Um, and uh, Pamela and Lisa, I wanna reach out to you to see how you want to kick off those videos, whether it's the mayor or um, city manager or myself or one of you. Um, so we'll, we'll talk offline about that, but it's we're getting closer. It's been a little challenging getting their uh, information. So we're, we're getting closer. So you'll see some videos being posted very soon, uh, outlining uh, the article that you attached to the agenda. So thank you. Great. And then just one last item, the business assistance program update, our business support loan fund program. We've assisted um, over 114. We just recently approved another business. So the, the funds are still available for our loan program. We've approved over 1.3 million and um, we're looking and researching some programs to possibly consider um, for, we had the special fund of $3 million that the city council approved for. So we will um, update the committee um, on how we will further that program. Great, anything else, Lisa? Okay, are there- I have any a question. Yes, I have yes, Ellen, please. I, yeah, um, Lisa or, or um, Pam, um, a couple months back, we, we've been talking in um, over the years about a brochure or a video, your, your video comment reminded me. Um, so what's the status or, or where are we on that brochure? Is this regarding the business assistance brochure that we talked about a few meetings back? Yeah, I don't know if it was business assistance, but it was a, yeah, a, a city brochure to attract businesses, I think. Yeah, yes. so that was our business assistance okay. brochure that we discussed and we reviewed um, a few meetings back. We actually received uh, design, some designs from our consultant, our, our, our graphic community, our graphic artist. So we're in the process right now of reviewing that and then paring down the information. So at some point, maybe in the next meeting or the one following, we'll bring that back to the EDC. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Any other questions for Lisa or Pamela? And then uh, moving to our last item, anything else that uh, the Economic Vitality Committee would like to initiate? Any other questions? I had one that I'll wait till the end, but uh, Kelly's got her hand up. There you are. Hi, Kelly. <laughs> uh, sorry, that must be yeah, I forgot to lower it from earlier. Sorry, oh, okay. I'm good. All right. No sorry, problem. my apologies. No, no worries, just checking. Anybody else that we haven't heard from uh, today? Uh, Mr. Baker? Any uh, any questions or thoughts? No? Okay, the only, uh, and I, I did uh, give Lisa an opportunity to look into this. I was just curious how the business license numbers are looking with, uh, you know, COVID and a lot of closures that we've heard about from some of the smaller businesses, especially from a chamber perspective. Lisa, could you uh, give us a little update on that, please? Uh, I think would be in, of interest. Yeah, absolutely. And then Pamela, if, if you want to chime in as well, um, business licenses within our economic development department. And so I had a chance to chat with our business license um, supervisor and she did give me some numbers. Um, and But we want to keep in mind that these numbers are fluid because we're, we went through our renewal period and then we have um, follow-ups that we need to do with our, our businesses and everything. And so the, we, at the end of the fiscal year, we collected $4.8 million. Um, and then one item to note is our new fees that we collected for tobacco permits. And so for that, we, we collected over 24,000 and that's new. Um, and so in total over four, $5 million, which is more than the previous fiscal year, correct, Pamela? Or calendar year actually. So business licenses are collected on calendar year. And so um, in terms of number of business licenses, we, we did see less, but the highlight is that we actually collected more in terms of our business license tax. And so that was one note that we wanna stress is that while there may have been some 
closures of some businesses, other businesses were still um, performing well and doing well. And because our business licenses are based on gross receipts. And so, um, Pamela, do you have anything to add? Thanks, Lisa. I think Lauren um, referenced this as well, sort of, we don't want to be insensitive to the year that many of our businesses have had, but Lisa's right, looking at the overall numbers, some of our businesses did quite well. When we look at the drop in number of business licenses, what we are seeing is largely a reduction in individual employees or 1099 employees. So if you think about all the salons, right, many of them employ people as 1099 contract employees, right? And so uh, a number of those employees chose not to renew. Doesn't mean they won't come back at some point, but they chose not to renew for this particular cycle. And uh, pretty largely, that's where we're seeing most of the reduction doesn't mean other businesses didn't choose to move to another location or potentially decide that this was the time that was appropriate for them to close. But um, we're still trying to suss all that out. But really, um, Lisa's right, the, the narrative is less about the churn of the number of business licenses and more about what the return to those businesses is relative to their gross receipts. Thank you. Uh, anyone else have any questions about that? I just thought that would be interesting to know. So, and I find those numbers very interesting. So thank you for sharing that and looking into that for me. Yes, Steve Tracy has her hand up. Oh, there's, there it is. Okay. Hi, Tracy. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Um, Pam and Lisa, was it, uh, have you noticed by a particular sector at all? Um, you mentioned the 1099s, but was there any particular category or sector of business that um, was lower or had less I know, sorry. <laughs> no, I, let me, and let me come full circle. Life sciences off the charts. I really saw, um, sig I don't, you know, really saw some gains in life sciences. And then in uh, the computer or the computing, right? Like that cloud, the services of software and cloud computing and anything related to that, right? Because they were not necessarily constrained by the capacity restrictions and, Maybe even on the flip side, we're in greater demand, right, as they delivered their services in the cloud. So those two sectors that Lauren pointed out that we know are our strengths were really, uh, you know, that was the narrative. They supported those. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Pamela. Any other comments um, uh, for the staff or for the committee? Um, I, I can't remember what's what's on our agenda for maybe next month. Do we have anything queued up, uh, Lisa, just to get everybody excited for our next meeting? <laughs> I think, well, well, Pamela and I are gonna be chatting with you and Sharif to plan the next meeting, but we know that we do wanna come back to the committee um, as a follow-up to our conversation with uh, Growing Life Sciences. And so um, that's always going to be top of mind for our committee and for staff. And so we'll be coming back to that. Um, and then also our business needs survey that we have on our, um, our plan, our EV, our economic development plan as well. And so hopefully we'll have more traction um, on that for coming meetings. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and I just want to thank you and Pamela for all you do for these meetings. Uh, I know it takes a lot to get everybody scheduled and uh, arranging the speakers and the agenda. So I just want you to know, I certainly appreciate all the things you're doing to keep us on track. So, and I'm sure the rest of the committee does as well. So I think that's it. Any other uh, comments for the good of the order? Okay, I guess we are adjourned. It is uh, 8.55, so five minutes early. <laughs> It, enjoy your weekends and stay safe, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Very informative Bye. session today. Just want to let you know. Thank you, Maria. Yeah.